good afternoon guys uh, i think so we can start with the session um, uh, so before we start the session uh, just for technical reasons we won't be able to play the whole slide deck in the full screen mode due to some uh, display issues but we'll go through everything we'll uh, discuss um, good afternoon how is everyone doing good uh, did you have your coffee and everything for the evening? So you guys are ready for the multi-hypervisor. Um, thank you for selecting this some, uh, session uh, on managing multi-hypervisor uh, OpenStack Cloud with the single virtual network. Um, we submitted this session because we saw a need of it and then uh, we got the response back from you guys in regards to having it here and uh, discussing more about it. So before I go into the session let me talk about like my name is Dirat Sigal I work for PlumGrid uh, we are a solution provider SDN and NFE solution provider for OpenStack clouds uh, we are market leader I will say for uh, SDN and OpenStack networking for uh, SaaS type of platform service providers retail finance uh, and these have been very unique uh, cases where people started with uh, the default OpenStack and then default uh, OpenStack Neutron options. But then as they built their more clouds and they were looking into multi-hypervisor type of situation, some of those use cases, uh, they went for more mature, more stable, more differentiated uh, OpenStack solution. And uh, we provide uh, PlumGrid ONS uh, as a solution, SDN solution for OpenStack clouds. Uh, with me, I have Omar San here. Uh, he's my colleague at PlumGrid. Uh, he is a uh, sales engineering head uh, and leads all the people through these uh, deployments. And uh, he will walk you through like how uh, we do the solutions too. So moving forward, uh, what we see is uh, in OpenStack, uh, we have seen like people have different options of hypervisors out there. They have Zen, they have Hyper-V, they have ESXi, and then KVM. Uh, generally with ESXi, we have seen uh, as people are deploying their uh, clouds out there, they want to leverage uh, their traditional ESXi workloads uh, and VMs uh, into their OpenStack environment uh, with minimal disruption as they invest into these new type of uh, cloud workloads. So a lot of people have the ESXi uh, traditional workloads. Uh, they're building their clouds. They have many options of cloud. And uh, as they're moving towards uh, more of uh, cloud workloads, which are dominant with KVM, they want to connect the ESXi workloads with the KVM. So for that, what we see is networking has to enable this transition. Uh, where people still keep on leveraging their traditional workloads for their apps, but are able to migrate it towards the cloud side of the story. Um, so as we talked more to the enterprise IT and the DevOps uh, during our discussions, and uh, they are saying they are adopting uh, cloud quite a bit in their private data centers, they keep on coming to us that, okay, for their old ESXi traditional workloads, how they can fit them into this uh, OpenStack environment and then uh, move it forward. So let me share uh, this slide in regards to the SDX Central survey which came out recently, uh, like uh, I think so a couple of weeks back. And what we see is for different type of clouds, people are using uh, hypervisors and VMware ESXi is one of the largest hypervisors out there in clouds, right? There is no denying about it. And the reason uh, people have used uh, this is because they want to have access and utilization of their ESXi uh, traditional workloads and they want it to be the integral part of their cloud strategy. Um, the conversation uh, around any type of cloud management platform, it can be OpenStack, it can be vRealize or anything. Uh, people want to have ESXi option uh, as for their old workloads, but how does it connect into their, uh, uh, the new uh, cloud management platforms? Um, 
And there are a few reasons they gave us in regards to the VMware AXI, why uh, they think it's important, because you can tell them, just move over to KVM, put everything out there, it should be good, it should work. Uh, there will be a little bit of work to be done, but uh, it should work out for you guys. Uh, they have given three very key reasons behind uh, why they want to keep using ESXi traditional workloads and then have a path to migrate as more and more of their workloads go into KVM, then move all over from ESXi. So the first one uh, they talk about is the app workload optimization. Uh, by that, what they have uh, mentioned most of the time to us is that for single app, any app they're developing, if they have um, a need in which they want to leverage ESXi, they cannot go back and port everything over to KVM or another hypervisor. They want to use ESXi. And they have optimized their physical infrastructure or they have optimized or fine-tuned their whole ESXi environment uh, around this particular um, subcomponent within that uh, workload, and they want to keep it that way and they want to use it for their uh, apps. Um, and in the same category, they have KVM, right? For their uh, web server or their app server, they're using KVMs, and they want to connect it to database server, which is uh, running within uh, ESXi from the get-go. So they want to connect both of them. The second reason they have shared with us uh, has been more about the in-house hypervisor development knowledge, deployment knowledge. So for last so many years, 10 years, 15 years, they have worked extensively with ESXi to a point that people know about it, right? They have been trained, they have, been gone, they have uh, gone to VMworld, they have learned about new technologies. Uh, for some of them, the, their journey of virtualization started with ESXi, so they want to keep that knowledge base or to leverage it, right? So training cost from moving people out of VMware into a new one for the traditional workloads, it's too much, so they want to keep it that way uh, to leverage it as much as possible. Uh, the last one, uh, which has been shared quite a bit, is about the multi-year licensing agreements. Uh, so as they have purchased the licensing for ESXi and uh, they are in process of getting new licenses or leveraging the old ones, they want to keep their costs down. So these multi-year licenses basically force them also, or incentivize, I will say, to keep using their ESXi environment. And uh, for new cloud, uh, when they look at this agreements, they are like, okay, how much can I leverage my already uh, uh, expense uh, or the cost into my data center for these new cloud strategies and the implementations? Uh, what happens here is um, that uh, as they look backward, they see that virtualization made their life successful, uh, but it came with a vendor lock-in type of situation where VMware ESXi uh, made them lock into the ESXi um, across the board, and then they had to stick with VMware. For the cloud, uh, they have different options. They have vCloud, they have uh, OpenStack and whatnot. They don't want to go with the vRealize or vCloud or whatever options or proprietary cloud management platforms that's there. What they're looking at is they want to use more and more of OpenStack type of clouds. So not to repeat the mistake, or I'll say not to repeat the history of vendor lock-in in regards to the cloud management platforms, they want to use OpenStack but still they want to use the ESXi, the traditional workloads for these cloud management platform so that they can already leverage their existing knowledge. They can already ex uh, leverage their app workload optimizations they have done for traditional, but as they move on, they have KVMs, they have containers, they have bare metals and everything coming together for them. And they want to uh, basically bring move on to that uh, strategy so that as they more and more workloads go into the, as more and more workloads or applications are built for the new clouds, uh, they are able to uh, transition seamlessly uh, to that point. So this survey brings out the point, uh, and the same thing was about the OpenStack. As you can see, 
OpenStack is by far the most popular cloud management platform out there. Uh, in the survey, 58% of people have basically said they want to use cloud management platform of OpenStack, and they basically are building strategies around it. Uh, VMware, we realize, um, is 48% as a choice, and most probably it's because of the reason of the previous where they have built the proprietary clouds around it. Uh, one thing uh, we want to mention here is the another point which was brought in in regards to multi-cloud management platform. So as you can see, people don't want to manage multi-cloud management platforms. So this reinforces the idea about OpenStack that it's the most popular cloud management platform. People are investing more in it, and they want to converge their clouds on OpenStack. But they still want access to their traditional or previous workloads for the new apps they are developing for their cloud. So as we look into this, uh, people are looking at the OpenStack. Then the question was, like in cloud, what has been the biggest problem, right? And uh, what came out is networking is the biggest uh, major cloud problem, right? Uh, in regards to the mist most immature component within a cloud management. Uh, this goes true for VMware, this goes exclude for OpenStack and everything. And I think so the mixture of having two different type of hy hypervisor working within a similar cloud management platform like OpenStack contributes to this 76% number, right? Uh, most probably the 76% number might be a uh, little bit less if the networking of multi-hypervisor is a result, uh, but definitely it will uh, bring that number down quite a bit. The second problem they had was ease of management, that is 15%. Um, but when I look like three years or two years back within the OpenStack community, the ease of management was also a very high percentage. Uh, people had a lot of issues in rolling out OpenStack clouds, managing the clouds, orchestrating the clouds, spinning up the projects and whatnot. And uh, today with the work of uh, outstanding our distro partners like uh, Rackspace, uh, Mirantis, Audio, uh, ROS, and the community itself, the ease of management has been like substantially dropping. And I think so that's the same approach for networking, which will go out there too. So in regards to networking, uh, why uh, it's a problem and how we see it in the OpenStack cloud for multi-hypervisor. Uh, we went to the OpenStack multi-hypervisor uh, example. So if you go to the deployment guide of OpenStack.org, this is the diagram they give uh, in regards to how you can orchestrate an OpenStack control plane uh, for a multi-cloud type of environment. Because this multi-cloud is because of the reason that you have two type of hypervisors running there. Uh, one is ESXi, the other one is KVM. So let me just walk you through this uh, diagram, like how they basically position it. So what you can see here is on the left-hand side, you have a proprietary cloud, uh, which has a proprietary network, a physical network, and then you have a proprietary storage. On top of it, in compute, you are running ESXi, uh, which is pretty standard model for the, I'll say, the traditional workloads. And then you have to put another proprietary virtual network switch, which works with the ESXi. Uh, we all know what is the best proprietary virtual network switch which will work with ESXi. It's a VMware solution for uh, networking, right? And that basically plugs into the OpenStack control plane, and that's how you manage. But you, what you can see here is that you have built an entire cloud separately here within OpenStack control plane uh, to manage, right? So basically now you are building two clouds here. One is proprietary cloud, and then there on the right-hand side, uh, which is the cloud which is promoted and most adopted within OpenStack, is the open cloud, right? You have open cloud, you have physical network, uh, cross 86 type of uh, servers, and then uh, you have KVM, an open source hypervisor. Sure.
Uh, it wasn't working for me, so let's see if it works now. I'll try again. I tried that, it didn't work also. Better? Uh, let's try this way. Better? There are a few seats available here also if you want to go. <laughs> Thank you. So in the back, can everyone see it now? No. And work for me, sir. That's fine. Yes. Uh, uh, so Microsoft crashed. So it crashed now. Okay. Okay. So I think so. We won't do uh, ID troubleshooting. <laughs> we'll go with this one. So I'll go with the the suggestion by the guy in the back, and that's a better. Better? <laughs> okay. Back to square one? Cool. So <laughs> continuing with the, this is a new chapter, by the way. So <laughs> OpenStack multi-hypervisor example. So you go to the OpenStack.org, you go to the manual, right? And they have specific examples. And one of the example is this one. And most probably, this is one of the oldest one they have. And from the start of the OpenStack itself, uh, I remember there were questions, right? People used to ask us quite a bit in regards to, okay, I have ESXi workloads. I am developing my cloud strategy. I'm developing all these applications for cloud, but I need to use ESXi. So this is the diagram which came, and uh, this is exactly the same diagram. So we just uh, uh, created in PowerPoint. What you can see here is there's a proprietary cloud under the OpenStack control plane, uh, it's ESXi based. It has proprietary storage. It has proprietary network. And then the proprietary virtual network switch. Uh, by Most probably, that's where they think about the software-defined networking, and it's based on uh, NSX. And that basically talks into the control plane. But on the other side, you have the open cloud, right, uh, which is based on KVM, uh, has multiple storage solutions. It has physical network. And everyone desires to go towards the right side. Uh, they basically want to invest more into the right side, but uh, they are always, always looking in what is existing there for them in their data centers and how they can make it work with the OpenStack control plane. So with this, what we have seen is uh, generally people have to build two clouds, right? One entire stack on VMware side of the story, and the other side is the open cloud. And uh, people have always uh, thought about like how they can make their life easier. A uh, few things which can be done here is, one is about the networking, right? So you have proprietary network switch. You have a proprietary open switch. So you can club those. So you can have one networking. And then on the top layer also, they look at is, OK, can I make it faster? Can I make it automated? Uh, so they are looking at the templates also. So they don't want to learn the two template policies, like one going towards the proprietary cloud and the other one which is going towards the open cloud. So they want to have a single template where they can basically orchestrate the networking and all these uh, um, configuration orchestration of IS layer for their whole uh, cloud, irrespective of which hypervisor they are using. So with PlumGrid ONS, uh, 
people have been able to basically combine both the clouds and make it into an open cloud. Uh, this is uh, where um, the open networking suit, our uh, plum grid solution basically comes into the picture. Uh, people have deployed it across the board on basically doing the networking for the ESXi part of the story and also putting it on the KVM side. So build one networking layer which basically take care of both the hypervisors, use the policy and template driven orchestration provided by OpenStack, uh, that is basically the heat, so automate entire process. So you don't need to worry about learning about two type of networkings, two type of clouds, uh, policies, uh, two type of orchestration, single OpenStack and through OpenStack you manage everything. So before uh, I jump into uh, like uh, how it is done, let me explain you a little bit about PlumGrid ONS, why and how, why people decided on ONS, right? Uh, why did it become important for them to consider this option rather than investing both sides? So PlumGrid ONS uh, is a software-defined networking solution. It has no hardware dependencies. Uh, Basically, uh, we, bas uh, our, we render the full network inside the compute nodes. Uh, so you have your compute nodes, your uh, physical infrastructure. Uh, so the entire network, your full network is rendered on your compute nodes as you're running the hypervisors there. Uh, generally, the traditional, sh traditional solutions, you have your switch or a router running in compute node, but then you have your layer three to layer seven, something running up in switches or northbound, right? So that basically creates a traditional situation where you have a very low level functionality running in compute nodes, but as you are scaling, as you're making your um, clouds bigger, all your traffic will need to go through some DHCP, some DNS, it will need to go through a firewall, it will need to go through a NAT, right? And all of that will have to go up and then create scalability, scalability issues, it will create uh, performance issues and uh, those type of problems. In case of PlumGrid ONS, all that is rendered in your compute nodes. It's as simple as that, right? So no traffic le uh, leaves your compute nodes and goes top into a localized uh, appliances and goes back. So what you are able to do is you are able to create a distributed data plane and uh, you have a scalability, you have performance, like as you are building your cloud, you add more nodes. These uh, virtual network functions basically uh, create your network topologies within the nodes and uh, you keep on scaling with that. With, the, with ONS, you get the plum grid network function libraries, like you get the router, DHCP, DNS, NAT, everything out of box. And then uh, we also uh, provide the ability for third-party virtual network functions like firewalls and load balancers to be inserted into the network's uh, topologies you are building in the software. So what happens here is as you, so as you are building your software-defined network, uh, you're building your topology for your app, what you do is you basically build your virtual domains. So what is a virtual domain? It's a logical data center which we are building for your network uh, and admin or a user can basically define their uh, virtual domain which basically connects whatever uh, the way they have uh, their topology. In the case uh, on the left side you can see a person wants to have bridges and routers and then go through a load balancer into the cloud. So Anyone uh, having access to the, uh, the open stack uh, can build this topology and be done with it, right? And someone wants to have a different topology which has DHCP or the firewall, uh, they can basically build that virtual domain. And further, you can replicate and clone these virtual domains as you scale further for different tenants, right? So if tenant A is similar to tenant F, you basically build the same virtual domain for them and they can keep on replicating further up there. Uh, for us, uh, 
the underlying technology here is based on a uh, Linux Foundation uh, collaboration project named as IOVisor. Uh, the importance about that one is like, as I talked about, like we are rendering all of your network, uh, full network on your compute nodes. It's because of the IOVisor. So the Linux uh, Foundation, uh, we basically uploaded, uh, upstreamed uh, our core code in regards to the IOVisor. And uh, it's about a universal virtual machine which is running in Linux kernel at runtime. So as you build your uh, network topology, it's built at runtime and uh, basically uh, doesn't create any static uh, type of uh, issues or platform uh, problems. So you, with the beauty of the IOVisor, you are able to build your network runtime as you're building the virtual domains, tear them down, build them again, and scale them as you move forward. As it is running within the kernel, Linux kernel, you don't have performance issues of going into the user space or coming back into the kernel space. All of this is processed within kernel space, so you get the very efficient performance of the CPUs or bare metal you are looking for in the computes. Okay. So what are we do demoing here? Uh, we are going to demo uh, for you, uh, connectivity between KVM and the ESXi workloads across a single tenant. Uh, we are going to show you uh, how it is done uh, with OpenStack heat template. And uh, it's basically a standard Neutron API-based uh, calls we are making. And the uh, setup here is uh, going to be simply uh, OpenStack distro uh, installed on uh, a compute nodes. Uh, one of the compute nodes is running ESXi, the second is running the KVM, and then you have three controllers. Uh, we have a gateway which connects uh, this topology to the outside world, and then you have VMware vCenter uh, running the, the ESXi, managing the ESXi. So, Omar. Konnichiwa. Still have to talk about the So just to give a recap of what uh, Dheeraj was explaining, um, on a physical side, right, we have is a standard OpenStack deployment. You can use any distribution. This particular demo is a recorded video demo. We will show you is based on on, on Mirantis. And then you have compute nodes where your hypervisors are. Uh, on the OpenStack controller nodes, we will also we have also running PlumGrid directors, which is the management part of our solution. And on the KVM compute nodes, we have uh, PlumGrid IOVisor running in the kernel module. And then we also have uh, sorry, this is the KVM. And then on the ESX side, we also have PlumGrid IOVisor, which is the uh, you know on the on the compute nodes. Additionally, we have PlumGrid Gateway. This is the icon which connects the this VXLAN fabric to the internet or you know a legacy IP environment which uh, does not support uh, virtualization. To make this solution work, we also have uh, in an ESX environment we have a VMware vCenter running. Right. What makes the solution work is the following: we have additional pieces of software. One of them is a PlumGrid. A uh, virtual uh, VMware agent, right, which runs on the directors. Additionally, there's a standard vCenter uh, driver in OpenStack, and we have applied some patch to which, which will make the whole magic happen. And what we'll demonstrate is on a single OpenStack project, we are going to bring up, uh, create two networks, connect them via router, then we will spin a VM on, connect them to a network on this side, which is going to be and ESX VM, second VM is going to be on another network, which is going to be running on KVM, and we will just ping across, right? A very simple demo, but it's a very powerful message, right? Uh, you can also apply standard OpenStack uh, uh, APIs. You can also use security policy. You want to use LBAS. Whatever you use OpenStack standard, the solution can support it.
about six minute run and I as it goes through I will try to you know talk about it as we go along. First we will give a bit of an overview of the of the setup. We will look at from the fuel node where various control nodes and the compute nodes are uh, you can see you know one of them is running VMware other are running uh, KVM. And then we will switch to OpenStack Horizon. And OpenStack Horizon, you can look at the setup of your system. Under system, look at the various hypervisors. And as you can see, there's one node which is running VMware ESX, and there are a bunch of other nodes which are running uh, KVM. You can also get a, a view of this on PlumGrid GUI, which gives the, the zone, you know, PlumGrid zone overview. And I was showing you there are three nodes running plum grid directors, and there are other nodes which are two of them are running as gateways, and there are several other compute nodes which is going to onboard the, the VMs. If the resolution is not clear, my apologies. Okay, I can, I'm happy to explain uh, afterwards too. Now this is again is a is a is a heat template, the YAML file that we have created, where we are going to actually through heat template is going to make standard neutron calls when we are going to run it in OpenStack. This is where we are creating the the, the networks, creating a router, connecting them. If you want, you can have external connectivity. If you want to do security groups, you can do whatever you want in, in OpenStack. So we keep call this two bridges and provider. That's just the file name. Then we will go back to Horizon. It's a matter of a few seconds. And in standard op uh, OpenStack way, you will go ahead and upload the the YAML file. Apply the tenants. Uh, if you give it a name. And then you will apply the tenant's uh, credentials, uh, either as an admin or the tenant. And then you will enter the password. And then you just hit on launch. Now it will go ahead and make standard OpenStack, you know, Nova and Neutron calls. And the topology will start getting built in OpenStack. And as it is happening on, on OpenStack, we are also building the virtual domain that I was showing you in the previous slide dynamically on the PlumGrid uh, UI. Okay. Again, this is happening in the background. The virtual domains are getting built. The PlumGrid you know, going under virtual domain. Looks like it's done. Now we will go ahead and launch an instance. And we're going to go, the first instance we're going to launch is going to be with the VMDK file, which is going to be expected to install on, on the ESX node. You can see that we will select the VMDK file. We will associate this one to a network called Dash 200. Yeah. As this instance is coming up, we can go back and again look at PlumGrid again. This is the already topology is built on OpenStack. The same topology will show up as a virtual domain on PlumGrid side. And we'll take a quick look at that.
Uh, what you can do is the first time the virtual domain, the icons may look a little bit unorganized. You can welcome to drag and drop them however you want. And then do a right click, deploy on our on our GUI, and that will save the view of the of the virtual domain as you want. And then after that, you can go back and forth, and every time the view will look as you would uh, desire it to be. If you look at the networks, remember 200 is the one which is the ESX network, and the second, sorry, 100 is the ESX, and the 200 is where the KVM is. Now we launch another instance, and we are going to go, and this is going to be with the uh, standard image, and we're going to go and boot it up on, on the KVM node. Now, if you want, even through heat templates, you can boot up images too. I mean, this is just to demonstrate that the connectivity is there. So again, the VMware VM came up with 100.2. The other one came up with 200.2, the one on KVM. I will go simply to vCenter. I will go ahead and uh, console into the VM, which was 100.2. IP address here is 100.2, 100.2, and we'll simply go ahead and ping 200.2, and connectivity is fine. If you want, you can apply security groups. If you want to do LBAS integration, you want to create whatever complex topology. It's a very simple solution. We support it. So I'll give it back to, to Dheeraj to complete the, the rest of the slides. And happy to take any questions you have in the end. Thank you, Mark. So as you showed, uh, sorry. So uh, as we showed, like how uh, it's simple, basically for a, even a multi-hypervisor example, that you can take, make networking also easy uh, to implement and use it for that type of environment for an OpenStack cloud. Um, PlumGrid ONS basically will provide you out of box, easy, uh, straight, uh, and simple templated form in which you can automate whole of your uh, orchestration of uh, uh, cloud uh, for the networking and then uh, the workloads uh, for the apps. Uh, with this, uh, you can make sure that your traditional ESXi workloads uh, for the same apps can work with the KVM uh, workloads as you're getting them together. So this is... Uh, one deployment case study, uh, we cannot disclose the name of the customer here, but uh, what uh, happened here is, uh, I, don't, I can't do the animation now on this one, but the point here was they deployed the PlumGrid ONS on their OpenStack cloud. Uh, they had uh, uh, the PlumGrid directors, edges, uh, and the gateway, and the LCM, and the VMware center, everything deployed. They had a uh, few uh, VMware uh, SQL servers and Microsoft SQL servers running on the ESXi. And then they had uh, the Apache web servers running in the KVM. And uh, the point here was they are pushing apps onto the uh, website, and they are basically uh, looking uh, to build more and more of it. So with the virtual domains, uh, what they did is Suppose uh, one of their customers came and asked for a specific set of uh, an app. They went into the library. Uh, they created a NAT function with the routers and the switches and built the, uh, the VMs. And they spun up the VMs of Apache and the SQL Server and then gave them a specific virtual domain or virtual network profile which works with their app. Uh, then the second user came, asked for the same thing, but had a different requirements in regards to the router and the NAT and the configuration. They basically spun it up through the heat template and created another virtual domain uh, for that customer. And it basically uh, spans further and further, like you can have a lot more 
tenants of yours, projects of OpenStack projects of yours coming in here further and further down the lane, and you can keep using your uh, VMware uh, workloads, traditional workloads, and uh, for uh, and the KVM workloads for your cloud. So, in summary, uh, what we want to point out is. Uh, SDN uh, within the OpenStack multi-hypervisor environment has to fulfill these four things. Out of this presentation, if there is anything I want you to take away is these four things, right? One is micro-segmentation, uh, that is basically via virtual domains, can be done in OpenStack with both ESXi and KVM. It's not just towards the vCloud or vRealize type of environment, or it's not towards just that you can run KVM and then do it, right? So if you have a multi-hypervisor environment, micro-segmentation can run in OpenStack uh, with a single SDN. Uh, you can basically apply all your uh, security policies and uh, group permissions, everything out of box, the OpenStack ones, for a multi-hypervisor environment. So there is no need to go and do specific uh, security type of things separately for an ESXi environment and then for a KVM environment. So this can be pushed into the OpenStack cloud with such an environment out of the box. Uh, you can automate uh, whole of this process, uh, which will run basically a few seconds, few minutes, as much time your uh, VMs basically need to spun up with the heat templates. And the last one is you can optimize uh, your existing hypervisor uh, investments. Uh, if you want to learn more, uh, if you want to uh, discuss further about your environments where you have such situation, uh, you have ESXi workloads, but now you are moving towards cloud and are using more applications based on KVM, uh, stop by our booth. It's uh, T69. Uh, we have demos running there. Uh, you can basically pick up the book where we have uh, discussed this uh, test case and also has the user testimonials and whatnot. And then we'll be more than happy to help you with uh, answer your specific questions. Uh, I think so. We are out of time, but any questions? Okay. Thank you. <laughs>